This program is brought to you by Emory University. There are three things that people will die for, their faith, their freedom, and their family. And in our Law and Religion Center, we study all three. So far this morning, we have dealt with the faith and freedom questions in a variety of different ways. And now in this last session of the afternoon and in our evening session, we are going to shift over to another major theme of our work, issues of marriage and family and the contested terrain that that presents both for law and for theology. I'd like to introduce as the chair of this last session a new leader at Emory University, Dean Jan Love. She is the dean of the Candler School of Theology, a distinguished political scientist and theologian and ethicist with keen interest in ecumenism and the place of religion in international affairs ideally suited for the deanship at the Candler School of Theology. And we emphasize the Candler School of Theology because that unit on the campus has been our partner from the very start in the work of law and religion. With Dean Jim Waits and his successors in office now leading up to Dean Jan, Dean Jan Love, we have had consistent participation by the Candler School of Theology in all of our work. 16 members of the Candler School of Theology faculty are either senior fellows or associated faculty in our center, and it's been a very strong intellectual and critical tie to the work that we've been doing over the past 25 years. So it seems only eminently appropriate to have as the chair of this session the great dean of the Candler School of Theology, Dean Jan Love, who will lead us in our final discussion and panel. Dean Love. Thank you, Professor Whitty. Welcome to this afternoon's session on the future of law, religion, and marriage. We have uh, three presenter and I'm sure three fine presentations. And so in view of the hour and uh, the amount of time allotted to this session, I think we will move uh, right into the presentations. The first is by Margaret F. Brinig, who is from Seton Hall, University, her JD is from Seton Hall University, and her PhD is from George Mason University, pardon me. She is the Fritz Duda Family Professor of Law at the University of Notre Dame. She specializes in family law, contracts, and dispute resolution, and is known internationally for her work on law and economics of the family. She's written or co-authored seven books and more than 70 articles including From Contract to Covenant, Beyond the Law and Economics of the Family, and most recently, the two-volume collection, Economics of Family Law. Professor Brinig. Hi, I've got these on two different laptops here. I'm gonna go over, hopefully I'll keep everything straight. I was uh, working on this while other people were talking, I'm ashamed to say, because I didn't realize that one of the things that we were supposed to be doing was talking about problems for the uh, next quarter century in, in our respective fields, and that's what I'd forgotten to do. So I'm going to spend just a minute and situate what I'm going to talk about, the little narrow piece of what I'm going to talk about in the grand scope of um, what's going to happen in family law. I'm about as good at predicting as uh, Doug Laycock is. One of the big themes that I think is going to be, and it's related to, to something that Doug said too, going to be talked about um, for the foreseeable future, it has to do with the de-legalization of the family or legalizing particular um, statuses. Um, the whole question of whether or not marriage should be privileged as a status, which of course is tied into the debate about same-sex marriage and whether civil union or something short of, of same-sex marriage uh, accomplishes the same purposes. Another angle on that is a question of whether the state should get altogether out of the marriage business so that marriage should be solely a religious question, something that 
that um, is being talked about today in other conferences. Another whole area um, that we are going to continue to deal with is the constitutionalization of family law. For example, we need to deal with whether or not there are limits to what is private and intimate behavior that the state shouldn't have any interest in. The most recent Supreme Court example of this is Lawrence versus Texas, the um, homosexual sodomy case. There are also same kind of an issue in the abortion cases and in um, Troxel, the grandparent visitation case. How much should be private decisions? How much should the state intervene? We see it also um, in all the concern, maybe uh, too great a concern about domestic violence that tends to permeate a lot of family law. A related question is whether or not the federal government should be involved or whether state government should. Um, the, part of what the Supreme Court has said, and we'll talk, I'll talk about this a little bit more, is that for certain parts of family law anyway, it's really a state court business, and particularly with child custody, divorce, and uh, alimony. We also are going to continue to be dealing with the choice and the choice that courts are making and the choices that legislatures are making between treating um, things that go on in the family as rights or treating them as part of a relationship. And that's the part that I'm going to be talking about. And, and uh, narrowly, for purposes of this con conference, I want to talk about children's religious rights. This is from a, a quote from a recent Supreme Court decision. Uh, the citation is below. It's 2004. And you all can read, so I'm not going to read it to you. The question is why the court is doing this. I guess I've got this here. Um, what's unusual about this? First of all, it's unusual that the court is at least feeling that the views of the child are relevant enough to put them down in the majority opinion in a Supreme Court case. Uh, there's a little picture down at the bottom of Jonas Yoder, who was the plaintiff in the Yoder versus Wisconsin case, um, one in which only Justice Douglas was willing to talk about the, uh, or consider really important, the religious views of a child. Um, this child, the child who's involved in Elk Grove and Nudo, was a kindergartner when the case uh, was filed. So it's not only that the opinion is worrying about the, the religious rights or not of a child, but also this is a very young child. Well, the question is on the board. Is this a, just throwaway language? Is this just sort of dicta in there? Stephen goes on to write that the girl's interests must be considered. He says the interests of this parent and this child, the father who's the non-custodial parent, and the child um, that he had um, out of wedlock are not parallel and indeed are potentially in conflict. And a court, what the court seems to be saying is that it is the conflict that's involved that's going to override the presumption that a fit parent speaks for the child and should always be the uh, spokesperson for the child and is capable of making decisions for the child. Got to stop looking at this and look at what you're seeing. All right, where does the, where does the presumption come from? One view, a view going to be really unpopular with this audience, is an economic view. That's the view that Gary Becker espouses, which is that parents and children's utility functions are interdependent. In other words, what makes the kid happy is also going to make the parent happy. Therefore, you can assume that if the parent is speaking for the child, that the child is going to be better off. Another that may be more popular with this audience is a view of John Locke. That is that children, while they remain minors, are imperfect. They're not totally capable of making rational decisions. Somebody's got to do it, and that person is going to be the parent. Another way of thinking about this is the view that um, Elizabeth and Robert Scott espouse, which is that parents are acting as fiduciaries for their children. They're given 
a lot of power over decision making in order to reward them for their consistent good behavior over time with very little tangible reward. So one of the questions that, that the law asks and that I like to think about is whether it's ever, uh, there are ever times when our confidence that parents are speaking for their kids um, is misplaced. One of the, what I, what the way that I rephrase that is to think about when is it that parents are likely to be thinking about themselves rather than about their kids. One possibility and the one that tends to surface in the um, grandparent visitation cases and the statutes that have been written in response to the Troxel case is that um, they're going to allow third parties to, or grandparents to try to seek some sort of um, custody access in times after the divorce of the parents or after the death of one of the parents or when the fitness of the parents is being um, contested. In all of those cases, it may be that the parents are really thinking not so much about their children and more about their own interests. So um, what do we do? If the parent or the kid is shouldering most, if the work of the parent is shouldering most of the responsibility, most of the weight, should we listen to the parent or should we listen to the, to the child? And the people down at the bottom here are the grandparents in the Troxel grandparent visitation case. And the real question, the question that's really uh, related to this conference as opposed to my interest in this topic in general, is whether or not it matters what kids' religious beliefs are. Uh, frankly. I mean, should we just forget about it and load them in the car and tote them off to church or Sunday school or, or uh, religious training uh, until they're 18 and then let them make up their own minds? Uh, or should we really think about what they're doing um, on their own? Is a presumption valid when we're, when we're thinking about what kind of religious beliefs are in the child's best interest? And what I want to do is to be unpopular once again and to give you an empirical look at what uh, kind of outcomes you get based on various things that might measure religiosity that kids might be exposed to. This is a very big national data set. It's about 9,000 kids have been followed since 1979. They're now parents themselves, so it's their children that are the subject in 1997 of um, the survey. It was done originally it's, um, on the B Bureau of Labor Statistics website. It's the study's been carried out at Ohio State. I have absolutely nothing to do with it. I'm just using their data. There are about uh, 3,000 kids, about 2,980 kids who are between 12 and 14 for whom all the questions that we want to look at um, are answered. And it's a nationally representative weighted sample um, to try to get at different parts of the population all over the country. What we have done is we've run a whole series of equations. Um, we're trying to predict two different outcomes that you're going to see. One of them is sort of a measure of optimism. How often do I think good things are going to happen to me? And the other one is delinquency. And I've got a definition of delinquency over on this computer if anyone cares. I can read you the way that they defined it. Um, we begin with a presumption that would be very common in economics, which is the more money you have, the happier you're going to be, and the less trouble you're going to get into. And then we start with just that one explanatory variable and then start adding other ones, dealing with family structure, um, dealing with the legal relationships between the parents, dealing with a whole bunch of um, sociodemographic data like race and gender of the child, education of the mother, um, age of the child, and then finally we have the two terms that we're really interested in, which have, um, they don't directly measure children's religiosity, but they measure parents' religiosity. How often do you say that your parents pray or go to religious services or do something else religious? And also, the other question that's asked is how many of your peers attend uh, uh, worship services? So this is what, what we're going to do. I'm going to show this uh, in a complicated version and then a less complicated version. Believe it or not, this is the, I've taken uh, 24 different variables that we've run and I'm only going to show you 13 of them. 
So I've cut it down some, but it's going to be kind of confusing. What I'm doing, the first one, the one on the left, is always sort of at the low end of the scale. If the question is, um, were you living in a married, in a, in a, um, a family where your parents were never married, one would be, yes, I was living in that, in a never married family, and zero would be, I was not. If you're talking about income, we don't take the zeros because there's some people who have absolutely no income. We take at the 25th and 75th percentile, and you'll see the weighting or the way that we, we drew it behind the little bars. So this is what they, uh, what they ask for the religious activities. I think I've run through this already. As far as your parent goes, how many times, how many days from zero to seven do you do something religious? Oh, this is religious activities, religious as a family. Um, such as go to church or pray and read the scriptures together. Um, they've also got a whole bunch of other non-religious kinds of activities. Um, this is the parent religiosity question and the peer religiosity question. So you can actually see I've kind of run through this verbally, but I will got it on the board too. And this is, this is the confusing thing. What you've got here is the needs is the income of the family divided by the census needs standard. And the way that, what reason we did that was because it changes based on your geographic area and on the size of your family. So we, we are trying to equalize how much income actually there is to spend per kid. Um, the second question there is, do you live in a family where you have a stepdad or not? The third one is, are your parents, uh, cohabiting or not. Uh, the fourth one, I, can you see this? Uh, fourth one is whether or not um, how old your mom was when she had her first child. The, second, the next one is how old she is now, um, how many years of schooling she had. So these are all sort of socio-demographic variables. There are a bunch of uh, race variables and the only two significant ones because that's how they, I chose the 13 things. These are statistically significant coefficients. Um, are black and Asian. Um, then we've got this peers attending uh, religious services, families doing religious things, um, parent is religious and non-religious family activities. And you can see that nothing seems to matter a whole lot really except maybe bio moms years of school seems to increase um, happiness some, so does, or optimism some, so does um, uh, more wealth. Um, if you live with, a, with cohabiting parents, you're less likely to believe that good things are going to happen to you and so forth. As I say, this is the complicated version. I'm going to show you another complicated one for the other question and then we're going to do a simple one. This is the one for delinquency. You'll see the one that older kids are more likely to be delinquent or more likely to, to rate high on this particular scale. That's the one that sticks out as does the one for adoption, the one for stepmoms, um, and some of the ones on the right-hand side that we're going to look at in a minute. Okay, these are the key values that, that I care about here. We've in both of the two that I'm going to show you, we've stuck in this need scale just as so, to show you how much it changes based on uh, needs. This is exactly the same thing from, from the other diagram, but it's blown up. And also, the relative difference between the influence of your peers going to church or to religious services and your parent. And you can see that as far as good things happen to me often, the one that's really important and even more or just as important as needs, the bi big increase is when your parent is attending religious services. On the other hand, if you look at delinquency, there's a small drop based on how much money your family has. There's a big drop based on whether or not your peers, your friends, go to church a lot. And there's just a small difference based on what your parents do. These are kids, of, these are the exact same kids in both samples, so we're not getting a different effect because we're dealing with different age groups or something like that. Ten minutes left, I'm going to be much shorter than that. What do we have then? It looks as though parental religiosity is relatively, uh, is related to an adolescent's outlook. And we've got a number of different, I just showed you one, but it runs exactly the same for um, 
all kinds of measures of uh, optimism and how happy you are, how much self-esteem you have, how much you feel you have control of your world and things like that. On the bad side, the, um, as far as problems go, it runs exactly the same as this measure for delinquency did. It's true of all kinds of acting out kinds of behavior. It's true also of um, depression and of anxiety. For these young people anyway, the behavior, the religiosity of their peers is related to actually doing things as opposed to having good or bad uh, outcomes. It's also true um, as for general behavioral problems, it's true for um, substance abuse as well. This is a Norman Rockwell praying, praying family here, other people gawking. So it looks like children's religion does matter. It matters as far as the outcomes that you have related to the child, right? Or at least their parents' religion matters or their friends' religion matters because we don't have the exact variable that, that we want. And it looks like it's really important. It's important as how wealthy they are. It's more important than a whole lot of other things. This suggests, especially the findings of the influence of your peers, that at adolescence we start depending less on our parents who may be really important for our core beliefs and outlook on, on the world and more and more influenced by the people who are around us, our friends and those with whom we hang out. And this suggests that, that uh, the, all the ads about um, it, do you know where your child is and the, the uh, aware and nagging parent is the best uh, reducer of um, drug dependence may actually be on to something. One of the questions is whether or not it's appropriate and we ought to think about kids' religiosity in really restrictive terms. And the American Law Institute's uh, proposals are going to get kicked around by Don, I think. Um, they have child custody provisions that uh, say that it should be inadmissible or uh, that the court shall not consider any of the following factors in deciding who should get child custody. And look at the one down here that I've bolded. You don't consider the religious practices of a parent or the child except to the minimum degree necessary to protect the child from severe and almost certain harm or to protect the child's ability to practice a religion that has been a significant part of the child's life. How the heck is a court going to know that, especially in, in relation to the pervasiveness of the factors that we've discussed before? I also want to look for a second at another Supreme Court case. This is also a Justice Stevens opinion, and it's one uh, talking about abortion and parental notification. This was a weird Minnesota statute that required that both parents be notified um, ex unless there was a judicial bypass procedure. And Justice Stevens wrote, it follows that the combined force of the separate interest of one parent and the minor's privacy interest must outweigh the separate interest of the second parent. And that's essentially maybe what's going on in the first case we talked about, the Nudo case, where you had one parent, the custodial mom, plus the child who says she's a Christian, outweighing the interest of the non-custodial parent. It also follows the, um, the whole doctrine about when you're able to um, engage in child custody litigation at all, a standing doctrine that suggests that sometimes what you, what's needed is the presence of one child and a parent in the jurisdiction is going to be enough to get the power of the court involved, although that's stretching things a little bit here. So as it was with these privacy cases, I think maybe with the religion cases it holds true, true also. If the child identifies with the religion of one parent, he or she should surely prevail against the other. So these are cautions about the regressions that you saw, which I'd be glad to send to anybody if, we, if they don't pub, you know, put, put all this stuff on a website somewhere. Um, the slides are kind of a snapshot. They don't represent causation. They represent things that occur at the same time. They're not, we have no way to prove that um, living with a step parent causes uh, more delinquency or less happiness or something like that. We know that they're associated and that's all we can tell. 
some things that, that uh, may be really important were so small because of the number of people in the sample that we can't really measure them, we can't really say anything. And so, um, for example, in black families, and we've run this um, uh, whole series of regressions for just black families and, and just Asian families as well, um, there's so few adopted kids, there's zero actually adopted kids in the, in the, among the African American families, so you can't really tell anything at, at all. Another thing is that, that all of the, what's called the R squared, all of the proportion of things that's actually predicted by the variables we looked at are very small. They generally run between 10 and 15 percent. So there's a whole lot else that goes into making happiness other than the things that were being surveyed here. And we haven't even scratched the surface in what we're looking at. We know that, but we're just reporting to you what the best we could come up with at the time. Okay. Next, we have Don Browning, whose PhD comes from the University of Chicago. He is the Alexander Campbell Professor of Ethics and the Social Scientist Emeritus at the University of Chicago Divinity School. Browning is also the first Robert W. Woodruff Visiting Professor of Interdisciplinary Religious Studies at Emory University and is a world-class scholar of practical theology and ethics. He's co-director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion's Sex, Marriage, and Family Project, for which he has written eight books, including Christian Ethics and Moral Psychologies, Equality and the Family, A Fundamental Practical Theology of Children, Mothers, and Fathers in Modern Society, and American Religions and the Family, How Faith Traditions Cope with Modernization and Democracy. <coughs> He's written numerous books and articles on the cultural, theological, and ethical analysis of modern psychology. So welcome, Professor Browning. Uh, you probably got the, um, the idea that I'm something of an interdisciplinary junkie. Um, and anybody that really knows anything about my career undoubtedly is asking the question of uh, why I am sandwiched between two legitimate professors of law talking about family within the context of family law. And um, uh, it is a good question. I hope the presentation will uh, illuminate that to some extent. But it does raise the question, what am I? And from what angle am I coming at this presentation on? I like to think that on Mondays and Wednesdays, I call myself a practical theologian. And on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I call myself a theological or religious ethicist. And on the weekends, I go back to what I used to be for 20 years, and that I was a professor of religion and psychological uh, studies. Uh, today is Thursday. <laughs> so it's going to be um, a theological ethics perspective, but you'll see a little taste of these other dimensions. And I'll say a couple of, of um, nice things about my colleagues here. This is totally an accident. Um, I'll say a couple of negative things about some other aspects of family law. And I'm not deferring to them because uh, I'm sitting close to them. It, um, I, I trust them. Uh, it just happens to be <clears throat> that I have a couple of nice things <clears throat> to say about them. Uh, Mr. Whitty has had a different kind of effect on me <clears throat> than he has other people. Uh, he functions to... Um, uh, terminate the speech of other people on time. His effect on me is to keep me going when I should have shut up on some topics a long time ago. Much of my early scholarly work was dedicated to analyzing the cultural and ethical implications of the modern psychologies and psychotherapies. Some of this involved reviewing and assessing what social theorist Philip Reeve called the triumph of the therapeutic. My studies convinced me that the models of health often projected by these modern psychologies unwittingly gave rise to norms of hedonic and non-hedonic ethical egoism. They implied that being psychologically healthy entailed an implicit moral obligation to make one's own satisfactions and self-actualization central to one's life. Although I was interested 
in the broad ethical implications of the therapeutic model of health, I did not anticipate that I would someday be studying the impact of the therapeutic on law. It was around 1998 that I read an article by Carl Schneider arguing that family law not long ago advanced moral arguments to support its positions, its pronouncements, but that more now, more frequently, it puts forward psychological and therapeutic arguments. I was slow to comprehend what a society does to heal, to exercise the therapeutic, a very legitimate thing to do, can influence, influence not only culture and ethics, but even law. This process of influence, however, is complex and works in concert with other cultural forces and social trends. The individualism of Western culture, their fondness for what Max Weber called technical rationality, and the rational choice logics of economic liberalism all interact with and reflect and feed the triumph of the therapeutic. In family law today, one can see the confluence of these forces in the growing dominance of two guiding principles. The principle of what is called private ordering for adults and the concept of the best interest of the child for infants, children, and youth. The idea of private ordering applies primarily to family formation. And the doctrine of the best interest of the child, as I understand it, applies mainly to family dissolution. Private ordering holds that adults know their needs and goals in their intimate family lives better than government, religion, tradition, or law. Therefore, law should have the flexibility to allow, follow, and support the sexual and procreative arrangements that grown men and women believe are best for them. The best interests of the child come into play when adult family formation decisions, often guided by the principle of private ordering, lead to family dissolution and make salient the issues of child custody, parental guidance, residence of the child, and financial support. The principle of private ordering increasingly guides family law dealing with what I call the front door of family formation. And the principle of best interest of the child functions more and more to guide family law at the moment of divorce, the dissolution of cohabiting couples, the complex issues facing legal and informal families using artificial reproductive technology, maybe one of the best examples of this drift of legal theory can be found in the American Law Institute's not too um, long ago report designed to codify emerging trends in family law called the principles of the law of family disillusion. I wonder when I first read that, I wonder why it wasn't the principles of family law but it mainly has to do with codifying the entire scope of family law around the principles of dissolution. My thesis is this. More and more family law in both theory and practice is legally defining the front door of family formation in light of the contingencies, strains, and emergencies of family dissolution, the back door of family life. The triumph of the therapeutic significantly, although not exclusively, w appears in the wonderfully positive sounding rule of the best interest of the child. Or to say it differently, the principle of the best interest of the children functions almost exclusively at the moment of family dissolution and hardly at all around the legal and moral channeling of family formation, at least with regard to massive trends of contemporary legal theory. Furthermore, the concept of best interest of the child often rebounds on the principle of private ordering to create even more variety and complexity in family formation. All of these dynamics have at least one overlooked major consequence 
for children. The growing tendency of law to channel and even exacerbate the likelihood that children will not live with and be raised by the parents who conceive them. Although these are not the only principles guiding family law today, they enjoy growing prestige. They are accompanied by two additional assumptions, that family law should be morally neutral and that it should be liberated from the influence of religion, especially Christianity. Many legal historians acknowledge that Christianity has had massive influence on Western family law up to the recent past, although legal scholarship on this point generally goes back no further than the 18th century. On the whole, legal theorists today consider this influence to have been negative. Boston University legal scholar Linda McLean and others have charged that Christianity is based upon faith and is therefore unable to pass the rationality test of law. Christian jurisprudence is variously viewed as grounded on mystery, for instance, Maria V. Entokoloskia, a European scholar, or blind sacramental authority, Henry Krauss of the University of Illinois, patriarchy and rigid hierarchy, uh, our good friend Martha Feynman of this school, unrealistic moral demands, Richard Posner of the University of Chicago, a now sitting judge, and many more such characterizations. Contemporary law's rejection of a place, and that's all I'm talking about, is a place for Christian jurisprudence in shaping or being in the conversation about contemporary family law is not, I believe, well grounded. It's based on a poor grasp of history and an inadequate understanding of the many dimensions of rationality found in Christian family theory. Law today is insufficiently aware of the multi-dimensional ways in which Christian marriage theory weaves together, or has in the past woven together, observations of the rhythms of nature, understandings of the needs of children, moral principle, and indeed, finally, integrating metaphors of covenant and one flesh union. Christian jurisprudence has, over the centuries, advanced an integrational view of marriage and family formation. It is concentrated on the front door of family life, the matter of family formation, rather than the back door of family dissolution. Its rationality can be seen in the range, validity, and mutually reinforcing character of the goods that it has thought to integrate. The classic statement of this integrational view of marriage can be found in St. Augustine's essay titled The Goods of Marriage. He explicitly listed prolus, having and raising children, fides, faithfulness between husband and wife, and sacramentum, by which he meant simply covenantal commitment and permanence. He discussed other goods as well, such as mutual helpfulness and the channeling of sexuality. These goods were integrated by two narratively elaborated metaphors, and I'll make quite a little bit out of that word metaphors before we go over, that were subject to multiple commentaries in both theology and Western law down through the ages. One comes from Genesis 2.24 and says that marriage is a one flesh union. And the other comes from Ephesians 5.25 and asserts that the commitments and sacrificial self-giving of marital partners should recapitulate the unbreakable covenant love of Christ for church, Israel, and the world. The fact that the demand for sacrificial love was addressed more to the husband than the wife constituted, as historians can now see, a striking contrast in these early Christian scriptures to the aristocratic and hierarchical ideal of the husband and father projected by Aristotle and his influence on the civic culture of Roman Hellenism that surrounded early Christianity in the early days. This integrational view was elaborated at the naturalistic level, the rational moral level, and the symbolic metaphorical level by various later Christian writers. It received its clearest and I think the most forceful articulation I like to say this since I'm a liberal Protestant, 
by the medieval Dominican Catholic, Roman Catholic scholar Thomas Aquinas. Before Aquinas developed an explicit theology of marriage, he asked a naturalistic question as to why male humans, in contrast to males of other species, form families and develop long-lasting relationships with the mothers of their offspring. His answer was this, matrimony, which Aquinas defined as the male remaining with the mother infant dyad, occurs at the human level because principally the long period of human infant childhood and childhood dependency. Aquinas believed that when the human male comes to recognize that the fragile child is his offspring and a product of his seed, flesh, and substance, a connection that the mother recognizes immediately through the labors of gestation and birth, the human father, having capacities of discernment that exceed males of other species, is more inclined to assist his consort and care for the infant as he cares for his own body. It's interesting to observe today that Aquinas got most of the naturalistic conditions for family formation at the human level in a way that's consistent with the bulk of evolutionary theory about family formation as we find it in that literature today. But in addition to this naturalistic level of analysis, which I'd say is at least a kind of rational argument, Aquinas Christian theory said that marriage should be long-lasting because of the vulnerabilities of both infancy and motherhood. Furthermore, it should be a matter of friendship because both male and female enjoy the dignity of being made in the image of God and some of the dimensions of rationality that his mentor Aquinas also talked about. And finally, to strengthen the durability of this one flesh trinity of mother, father, and infant, Aquinas added, these, added to these naturalistic, philosophical, ethical, and rational arguments the distinctively Christian or theological note that marriage should be modeled after Christ's enduring covenant relationship to church, Israel, and the world. Notice that the more theological argument comes at the very tail end of this elaborate multidimensional argument. Aquinas serves as an example of the multidimensional integrational view of Christian marriage. It is integrational in that its dominant metaphors of covenant and one flesh bring together and stabilize a mutually supporting unity of sexual exchange, conception, the needs of dependent infants, the procreative and relational inclinations of men and women, and their right to equal respect and mutual friendship in an enduring socially sanctioned institution. This view overcomes the dichotomy between adult private ordering at the front door of family formation and the situational best interest of the child at the back door of family dissolution. It does this by bringing culture, religion, and law into a cooperative relation that promotes an integrative pathway to family formation. It is short-sighted, I believe, to say that Christian jurisprudence of marriage fails the rationality test, is clouded in mystery, is based upon hegemonic sacramentality, is incurably patriarchal, impossibly demanding, without more carefully examining its integrative view of matrimony and its complex synthesis of naturalistic, moral, and metaphorical arguments. The prominence in family law today of the doctrine of private ordering means that most legal theory, not all, but most, has given up on the integrational view of family formation. The idea that law, in cooperation with other parts of culture, should channel the integration of adult sexual expression, parenthood, and the dependency needs of children into a publicly sanctioned institutional commitment. Private ordering gives adults the autonomy to separate the historic goods of marriage, sexuality from procreation, procreation from marriage, parenthood 
from marriage and the rearing of children from the parents who conceived them. This is done in the name of a false view of the neutrality of law. It reflects rather a watered down Kantianism that posits an equality, if not a democracy, of all adult desires and all adult choices. This ethic of adult private ordering is the lead principle shaping family law today. I could give countless additional examples besides the allusion to the law of the principles of family formation. It is a dog that's increasingly wagging the tail of the best interests of the child. However, it distorts the otherwise laudable best interest principle into a situation ethic designed to make the most of difficult circumstances which adult choices present to dependent and vulnerable children. A Christian integrational view of marriage directs law's attention to the front door of marriage law, the law of family formation. Law should not dismiss, dismiss this historic voice of Christianity simply because of its theological metaphors and narratives. The issue is not whether any theory of marriage, religious or secular, contains such metaphors, but rather how they relate, how these metaphors relate to other levels of rationality that a particular perspective exhibits. Careful analysis of the leading secular legal theories reveals that they are not without their own deep metaphors that serve as faith assumptions, uncritically held presumptions about how life is grounded. University of Utah legal scholar Martha Erdman intentionally grounds the doctrine of private ordering in the metaphor of the handshake. Marriage is like a handshake. In her view, covenant and one flesh union are out, and the metaphor of the handshake should suffice to order private intimate relations in today's world of autonomous individuals. One can find metaphors of molecules and individual atoms in the marriage law proposals of Stanford University law professor Lawrence Friedman, deep metaphors of symbiosis and nurturance in the work of Martha Feynman, free market and agonistic metaphors in the University of Chicago's Richard Posner, and status metaphors in Georgetown University law professor Milton Regan. There is, however, at least one exception, there are more, in law today to this trend in substituting alternative metaphors for the classic ones of Christian jurisprudence. This is the case of Margaret Brennick, from whom you've heard, who has, add this, who has creatively blended what I call a phenomenology, not a metaphysical defense of, but a phenomenology of the Christian, central Christian metaphors of covenant and one flesh union with a subordinate and quite rational theory of marriage and family drawn from the field of institutional economics. I can recommend her work. Future dialogue between secular law and religion will center on charting the relationship between their respective focal rationalities and their respective deep metaphors. Both sides have their rationalities. Both sides have their faiths metaphorically articulated. When this charting becomes more advanced, religious perspectives will emerge as far more rational than generally perceived and allegedly secular theories will be revealed to have their own unwitting foundations in some kind of faith. When this day comes, religious perspectives will be more carefully consulted and so-called secular theories rendered more balanced and less dogmatic. Thank you.
Our third presenter is Carl Schneider. He has a JD from the University of Michigan and is the Chauncey Stillman Professor of Ethics, Morality, and the Practice of Law. He's a professor of internal medicine at the University of Michigan. He's written extensively in several fields, including bioethics, professional ethics, professional education, family law, and constitutional law. He recently published with Marcia Garrison a casebook entitled The Law of Bioethics, Individual Autonomy, and Social Regulation, and is the author of The Practice of Autonomy, Patients, Doctors, and Medical Decisions. Professor Schneider served as a law clerk to Judge Carl McGowan of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit and to Justice Potter Stewart of the United States Supreme Court. Welcome, Professor Schneider. Thank you. I'm very apprehensive because one of the things that I learned about teaching fairly early on was not to do it after 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and I have to say, um, I am a big fan of the idea that um, husband and wife become one flesh, um, but I can never forget what Congreve said, uh, they may become one flesh but marriage still leaves them two fools. <laughs> I am so apprehensive about this idea of teaching after five o'clock that I have decided not to present you with anything very formal. Um, I don't want to say that I'm following the idea that you should um, teach them in parables, but I do have a story to tell you. And it's a story that picks up um, very exactly um, after the kind of to the talk that Professor Browning gave and t reaches in a different sort of way the kinds of problems that Professor Browning was talking about. Um, I am the author of a case book in bioethics, but before that, um, I was the co-author of a case book in family law with Peg Brinig. And in the process of preparing for that, um, I was trying to figure out something that would be interesting to do in the section on divorce when the law of divorce is so boring. The law of divorce is this. If you would like a divorce, you may have one. <laughs> That's not enough to keep the mind alive for a chapter. <laughs> and so I thought it would be a good thing for the students to try to think a little bit more seriously about what is, after all, one of the repeating features of family law, that it it continually must decide moral questions, whether it faces them expressly as moral questions or whether it handles them using some other kind of language. And so I sort of made up um, the case of Mr. and Mrs. Appleby of Milan, Michigan. Um, Mr. Appleby is 59. Um, at the time when I made this story up, that seemed to me quite an elderly age. Um, I now wish that I could stay 59 a little bit longer. Um, he has been married for some 30 years to Mrs. Appleby. Uh, they have one child grown up and moved out of the house. Um, pretty much at Mr. Appleby's insistence, Mrs. Appleby has never worked out of the house. Um, most of their friends are his friends, and not her friends. Uh, one, he is um, employed, but never been employed in a very lucrative kind of way. They have very little money. Um, one day he comes home and says, I have fallen in love with a 19-year-old co-worker, and I want a divorce so that I can marry her and live with her and her two infant children. And the question that I then asked the classes to think about was whether Mr. Appleby was morally entitled to a divorce. And the answer that I got repeatedly was that he was legally entitled to a divorce. And I said, finally, one, in one of the classes, no, I teach family law. I know that he is <laughs> legally entitled to a divorce. Hell, everybody is. Is he morally entitled to a divorce? And finally, the class began to ask, what's that mean? And I said, you know, morally. And they, one student said, I don't understand what that question is. 
if you'd asked me whether it was psychologically prudent of him to get a divorce, I would be able to address that question. But I don't know what you mean by morally. And I said, morally, about right and wrong. At which point, the editor of the Law Review at the time raised her hand and said, but that would make murder a moral issue. <laughs> and I said that I truly hoped that it was, <laughs> and that she would continue to think about it that way. At this point, of course, the professor is getting quite frustrated because the real conversation that he wants to have has been sidetracked by some problem of communication. And over the years, I began to try to figure out why we were not communicating better than we seemed to be. And part of the problem here was, I think, that for my students, um, who are, I think, quite representative of the professional upper middle class, um, they grew up in comfortable houses and comfortable times. For all of our talk about diversity, they come from a quite a narrow range um, of of social class. Um, and let me just say at this point, they're very lovable kids. Um, I, one of my side research interests has been in how people make decisions about legal careers, and I interviewed 40 of my former students to try to get some understanding of how they had made a decision to come to law school and how they'd made decisions about their careers after they left law school. And they were really inspiring interviews. I, I came away thinking very highly of all of these individuals that I had talked to. So, so that made me particularly anxious to try to figure out what was going on here. So I think part of the problem was that for them, morality referred only to sexual morality and probably referred only to sexual morality understood in what would pejoratively be called a puritanical kind of way. But I think that was only a, a fairly small part of it. I tried to get at the question by saying, forget about this question of what would be morally the right thing to do. What kind of conversation should Mr. Appleby have with himself about whether he should seek a divorce or not? And we came back to the therapeutic argument. It was to be an argument about whether or not he would come to realize that um, living with a 19-year-old when you're 60 um, is not as fully rewarding as you anticipate, and why living with two infant children um, is a lot more horrifying than you remember. <laughs> the next thing they said, though, was it really wouldn't matter even if he talked about this issue in moral terms because morality would not constrain him. And it wouldn't constrain him in a couple of senses. First, it wouldn't constrain him because, after all, he could still do anything he want to, wanted to and no agency would stop him. And it wouldn't constrain him because he would be intellectually ingenious enough to find a rationale for whatever he wanted to do. And that led to, I think, an even more common view, which was that he might well have moral ideas, but those moral ideas were happenstantial. They were the ideas that he happened to have been brought up with and had no more meaning beyond his own historical experience than any arbitrary fact would. And it was certainly not something, this the kind of moral constraints on him, it's certainly not something that he could discuss profitably with other people. We all have our own values, and those values are simply this idiosyncratic process or product of history. And so I said, well, what would you do in his circumstances? And they hewed to their belief that morality is essentially arbitrary. And they said, well, I, I might not get a divorce, but that's just me. That's just the way that I was brought up. And so I tried to probe a little further and got 
another kind of criticism of morality, which was that it constrains. And the idea that somebody, somehow, something, somehow, might be limiting your freedom seemed to them very wrong and, in fact, stigmatizing and punitive, which was part of the problem with morality, that it stigmatized people and that it was punitive. Punitive did not mean arising out of a desire to punish, to deter. It meant that unpleasant consequences might follow for whatever kind of reason. But punitive was the word that they used to describe the unhappy consequences. So I said, what about the unhappy consequences for Mrs. Appleby? We've been focusing on the unhappiness that it might cause Mr. Appleby if he restrained himself from marrying the young woman. And the students said a couple of things. The first thing they said was that Mrs. Appleby would be behaving wrongly. They really don't mind thinking morally if you don't call it thinking morally. <laughs> she would be thinking wrongly if she tried to restrain him from getting a divorce. And one of the things that I had said in setting up the hypothetical was that Mrs. Appleby was very strongly opposed to the idea of a divorce, partly for religious reasons, partly for economic reasons, and partly for social reasons. Um, she would be socially isolated, and partly because her life had become so intertwined with her husband's that she could not imagine what life without him would look like. But the argument I got was that her attempt to limit him was an attempt to constrain him from doing what he was entitled to do, what everybody is entitled to do, and that is to find a happy life, to find a life in which you can grow and become the kind of person that you believe that you ought to be. And in fact, a few students took that argument further and said that Mrs. Appleby herself was at fault because she had run her own life irresponsibly. That she was obliged, like all people, to be responsible for the decisions she made. And she had put herself in a position which now made her very vulnerable. She had made herself dependent. And dependence is not a situation that responsible people should allow themselves to slide into. And here let me say parenthetically that in my work um, as a bioethicist, um, I encountered that view of sickness um, from courts um, and even um, from patients. That the, the, the horror of sickness is that it makes you dependent, and dependent is a humiliating and degrading condition. So Mrs. Appleby had allowed herself to fall into this humiliating and degrading condition and really should not be heard now to complain about the consequences of her decision. Now, there were some students who felt that, although you wouldn't want to say that Mr. Appleby was morally constrained, he was constrained. And he was constrained in a way that you might well predict, which is that he had, he had shaken hands. He had shaken hands. He had entered into a contractual relationship with Mrs. Appleby. And so the question then was, well, OK, um, what about the doctrine of efficient breach? Is that what you plan to advance here? The doctrine of efficient breach, for those of you who are not law students or who went to law school before um, Judge Posner became quite so powerful, the doctrine of efficient breach says you're in a contract. If you can breach the contract and pay the damages to the other party to the contract that make that other party whole, with you still being better off, it's an efficient breach. Everybody is better off, or at least the whole, everybody in the whole situation is better off. The breached against party is no worse off, and you're better off. And the answer was yes, that it would be impossible to hold him to the contract. And it would, in fact, be impossible for he himself to hold himself to the contract, that he was in the grip of 
preferences that he could not control. So you could not hold him to the contract in the sense that Mrs. Appleby wanted, which was him staying home whether he truly loved her or not. But you could demand financial damages. She, he was supposed to put her in the same situation that um, she would have been in economically had the marriage continued. And I said, I constructed the hypothetical so that that can't happen. He doesn't have enough money to support two households. He can't possibly do that. And at that point, they said, in that case, um, he is simply a judgment-proof defendant. He can breach his contract. Um, he has a sort of continuing duty to pay, but if he cannot fulfill the duty, um, that cannot stop him from seeking his freedom. Now, I think there is a very complicated set of things going on here that may give us some insight into some of the very complicated things that are going on in family law. How much time do I have? 10 minutes, okay. Um, I'm sufficiently German to believe that the things should run on time and that um, the best way to be sure that you end on time is simply to stop when the time elapses and that's what I plan to do. In, in the meantime, as Professor Browning said, there has been quite a large change in the way that family law has talked about the problems that it faces. The language which the law of the family uses is decreasingly the language of morality. And that's happened in a variety of ways. But before I explain those, let me rush to say that I am not suggesting at this point that family law has necessarily become less moral. And I am not suggesting that you cannot find moral justifications for almost all the positions that the law has adopted and almost all the positions that commentators about the law advance. I'm talking about the language that the law uses. And that language has changed a lot. And by the law, I mean the legal institutions that have to announce law and make legal decisions. Let me give you a couple of examples. The obvious example here is, is no-fault divorce. It used to be that if you wanted a divorce, you had to go to a court and you had to say, I made a promise and I have been morally relieved of that promise because of something for which I am not responsible, generally the moral fault of my partner, and then the court had to think about whether or not that was a sufficient moral justification. Um, now, of course, and I'm generalizing hugely, um, divorce is available essentially on the demand of one party, and any thought about the moral justification for the divorce um, must be undertaken by the plaintiff or the petitioner seeking the divorce. Um, similarly, in a lot of the problems that surround the divorce, like child custody, uh, the division of marital property, uh, decision whether to grant alimony, um, there used to be a fairly large moral component in many ways in many of these areas. Um, and increasingly, there are attempts to find ways of deciding these kinds of cases without talking about moral issues. Um, the child custody area is um, an excellent example of that, um, and one of the important ways in which this has happened is that courts have looked for experts in child welfare, psychologists, psychiatrists, to tell them what would be best for the child so that the decision becomes a technical question about what is therapeutically best for the child. Um, the court listens to the experts and chooses the expert that seems to be making the most sense. There's another kind of example of this change in moral language that is exemplified by the opinion in Roe versus Wade, which I will briefly describe to you so you have a somewhat more accurate sense of what it did with the moral question that agitates people about abortion, which is the moral status of the fetus and the way in which the situation in which the woman finds herself um, should be thought of morally before an abortion is sought. The court starts off um, in a very strange kind of way. The opinion is very important 
Um, before Roe versus Wade, essentially what you'd had in relatively modern law was really a couple of two or three contraception cases, um, the last of which was based on an equal protection argument, not an argument about what your rights are. The court says very vaguely, there are a lot of places where you might find a right to make this kind of decision, um, and we don't really have to decide what it is, but, and I'm quoting almost verbatim here, whatever it is, whatever the source is, the right is big enough to encompass the woman's choice of whether to have an abortion. The court stops then. It does not try to explain more why that kind of choice is a choice that endows you with specially strong constitutional rights. The only additional thing it does in talking about the origin of the right is to say if the woman didn't have this right, she would suffer in lots of kinds of ways. Well, that's not really an explanation because we suffer in all kinds of ways from all kinds of law without thinking that the fact that there are detriments gives us a right to resist the law. What was particularly interesting about the detriments was that they were therapeutic kinds of detriments. They were either physical kinds of detriments or psychological kinds of detriments. The woman, the court goes on to say, this is Justice Blackman, the woman makes these decisions in consultation with her physician, suggesting once again this is a kind of technical problem. And in fact, the court actually expressly says at one point that the physician will decide in consultation with the patient whether the abortion is a good idea or not. The court, having finished establishing to its satisfaction that there was a right to make this decision, then presumably was going to talk about the state interest in the fetal life or whatever it is. And the court says, it's a really hard question what the moral status of the fetus is, and people disagree about it a lot. Let's think about this moral status of the fetus, and they do it by asking whether or not the framers of the Constitution supposed that the fetus was a person within the meaning of that word in the Constitution. And after an extremely laborious investigation of one, the emoluments clause, the apportionment clause, um, the court concluded that the framers never had fetuses in mind when they wrote the Constitution. The court then said, Texas may not, by adopting one definition of life, preclude the woman from exercising her right. But it never said why. So the moral issue that has aroused so much anxiety after Roe versus Wade was simply never addressed by the court. The next thing that happened in this story, essentially, was Casey, the case in which the court looked as though it might overrule Roe versus Wade and didn't. And the influential opinion in Casey starts off by saying, Liberty finds no refuge in a jurisprudence of doubt. And it harshly scolded people who had not acquiesced in the opinion because the Supreme Court had spoken, and once the Supreme Court speaks, we should stop criticizing and stop causing social trouble and, going along, and go along with the court's decision, particularly when the court has told you so often that that's what you're supposed to do. So I think part of what was going on in that decision was that the justices lived in a different world from a lot of the people who have been upset by the decision. They lived in a world in which the moral status of the fetus had not been a difficult question. And I think they were quite astonished to find the kind of reaction to Roe versus Wade that they got. And that they were astonished because their moral vision was such a limited one. And that is, I think, more generally a problem with the tendency to avoid thinking about problems and talking about problems in moral terms. The people the law regulates, the husbands and the wives who are getting divorced, the husbands and the wives who are getting married, 
do in important ways think about their relations in moral terms. They expect that the law, which they don't really know, will also be talking in those kinds of terms. When they go to the court on divorce, they expect to get justice, and they expect to have their relations analyzed in the moral terms in which they're thinking about them. Um, there's some quite interesting empirical information about people who practice divorce law who have a terrible time because the clients keep saying, you don't understand how unfair this all was. And the lawyers keep saying, if we keep talking about unfairness, the bill will run up and the court will never listen to anything that you're saying. So there becomes a kind of disjuncture between what the law seeks to accomplish um, and what people expect it to that makes it very hard for them to see each, for the people and the law to see each other very clearly. Now, I must be running out of time, so let me say the last thing here, which is the, the, the source for an awful lot of the moral ideas in traditional American family law, obviously, is religion. The question one might ask is, can we go back to religion in order to replenish the supply? And I think that one can be pessimistic for a couple of reasons. First, the kind of people who write AOI reports tend to be vehemently hostile to the law. I was at a conference once, and a classmate of mine came up to me, a classmate who teaches family law at a different institution. And she, before she said, hello, hi, Carl, or anything like that, she said, do you want to know why I'm not adopting your casebook? And I said, nothing, because I was so taken aback at, at this approach. And, um, and she said, it's because you included the marriage ceremony in that. Religion has no place in this casebook. I'd included the marriage ceremony because it's the most influential statement on the understanding of marriage in the United States. Um, to her, it was a religious document, and religious documents did not belong in discussions about family law. The other problem, though, is that I wonder what you get when you go to religion. When I talk to people who counsel um, young couples getting married, what they counsel them about is the same kinds of therapeutic things that the law talks about and my students talk about. The question that I would love to have you answer, because you're more knowledgeable than I, is whether if you actually go to American churches today, whether you're going to get a significantly different kind of approach to these problems from the kind that you get from the law. Thank you. Well, you've heard three very stimulating presentations, and we have time for um, one, two, maybe three questions. So if you are interested in asking one, please feel free to raise your hand and I will call on you. There are, there's the microphone, yes. Uh, Dr. Schneider, thank you for that opening. I'm one of the few non-academic people here. I'm a practicing lawyer, but- Yay! Yes! There's two of us. <laughs> but my most important roles are that I am mother of two daughters and that I teach Sunday school on a regular basis to kids um, at, the, at a Methodist church, actually here on Emory campus. Um, on Sunday, I went to see uh, the Dalai Lama in, uh, on Emory campus, and he had he talked about affection and the lack of human affection, and maybe your colleague could have been a little more affectionate towards you. But he also used the word nipple. So now, I, now that I've said it and he said it, what I'm going to say uh, may be shocking. I may get bleeped, but here it is. Um, when my daughter was young, uh, she, like most three or four-year-olds, would go around and she would say things like, boys have penises and girls have vaginas. And kids know that what makes a dad a dad is anatomy, and what makes mom a mom is anatomy. For example, the kids in my Sunday school class, their moms are just as likely to be doctors as their dads are. They have they have fathers who stay home and pick them up from school, who do all the traditional nurturing things. And yet we attend religious institutions all the time where the reference to the Holy One is in the male 
And a child, a wise child, may come to the conclusion that God must have a penis because we refer to God all the time as father instead of mother. My question to the panel is, does this, if, we, if, the, if the religious institutions could catch up with the three and four-year-olds who realize that God is neither male nor female, that God, um, could that reinvigorate perhaps the moral underpinnings for the, the family? Um, families exist, I think, in large part for the nurturing and preservation of our children. And I think really all religious traditions teach us that protection of the vulnerable, especially children, is something that the Almighty One calls us to do. So there it is. I said it. It's shocking. <laughs> Thank you. Does someone from the panel want to address this? Don? <laughs> They're fighting over it. That, that's right. Um, I think we've been struggling for a good part of the last 60, 70 years um, in many parts of religion to, to be able to get beyond simplistic uh, uh, gender relationships when talking about um, God. Um, that probably is a conversation and a perspective that can uh, proceed uh, more um, successfully when um, uh, children are older. But I'm not at all sure that the uh, conversation about how to talk about God in terms of uh, gender uh, will solve or should solve um, determinate references uh, to male and female at the more proximate level. Um, the one thing that I think you're absolutely right about is that the, the massive uh, weight of not only Judaism and Christianity, but uh, the other um, main religions of the world have tended to conceptualize marriage um, as a institution designed to handle uh, and regularize the vulnerabilities of one of the things that tends to happen when people um, get married, and that is a child uh, is born. Now, it doesn't mean it always happened. It doesn't mean that it, it, it always happens with older people. But the weight of the institution was very much uh, centered around that. And it really was brought home to me when John Woody and I and Christian Green, who's in the audience someplace probably, uh, took time out to edit a book called Sex, Marriage, and Family in the World Religions, where we brought together uh, the main documents that has shaped all six of the main religions of the world, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism. Family continuity and the cycle of the generations and what marriage contributed to that was a massive preoccupation. Um, not just the West, not just Christianity, not just Judaism. In fact, you can build a case that the two most ambiguous religions with regard to this importance of marriage with regard to family formation was Christianity and Buddhism. But careful analyses indicate that even they, who had a more complicated language, was as family-oriented and generation continuity-oriented as Judaism, Islam, Confucianism, Hinduism, were there, it's very strong. So um, but I'm not sure how the two levels of conversation, gender of God and um, family formation, maleness and femaleness, are exactly the same conversation. Okay, we have a question Thank here. Thank you. My, this question first occurred to me with Professor Browning's discussion of marriage in such explicitly Christian terms, but also I think Professor Schneider might be able to comment on this more particularly about the law. Given the law's requirement that it, that it govern a people of diverse moral visions, not just diverse religious practice, but diverse moral visions, how would you suggest then in our culture that we provide that order in a way, notwithstanding what has just been characterized, the immense weight of Christianity. How do, you, how do you govern these intimate and also very moral matters in a way that equally protects all citizens? Uh, just to kind of remind you again, I was not saying that the Christian tradition should dictate legal marriage and family. 
I'm just saying it has in the past made important contributions and probably should be in the conversation today. And the main way to my argument is that almost all traditions, and certainly Christianity, had a, um, um, a focus and a gestalt. Just because it's Christian, it doesn't mean that it's non-rational through and through. Looking at Christian arguments indicates you know, high degree and multi-dimensional levels of um, irrationality. Anybody who's religious and wants to contribute to family law today need to be able to bring the more rational aspects of their argument into the center. But they also need to confess that their rational foci will be shaped in some way by the metaphorical surround, and they're not the only ones. Secular law will have the same problem because their thought floats in a sea of metaphors as well. So we all have that, that obligation of tracing the relationship between our surrounding metaphors and our focal um, rationalities. Thank you. Pro oh, Professor Schneider had a, yeah. yeah. Um, I was trying partly to suggest that the ability of lawmaking institutions to speak intelligently when moral issues come their way uh, depends on the kinds of resources for moral discussion um, that exist in this society and that one possible source of them is religions of all kinds. Um, the, the question you ask is essentially the question of whether an intelligent, um, workable family law is possible. Um, my favorite comment on this comes from my favorite English judge, James Fitzjames Stephen. Um, to try to regulate the internal affairs of a family, the relations of love or friendship, or many other things of the same sort, by law or by the coercion of public opinion, is like trying to pull an eyelash out of a man's eye with a pair of tongs. They may put out the eye, but they will never get hold of the eyelash. Thank you. <laughs> but the trouble is, you can't avoid doing it. You can't avoid legally regulating the family because people are going to behave in ways that put them in conflict with each other about the kinds of things like property that the law regulates. One last question here. I, and you're going to be excited because I didn't have a question. I just had a compliment. My name is Tanya Stewart. I'm a, I'm a family lawyer. Yay. Not a theologian, really, but I am a minister. Um, Professor Snyder, I just wanted to thank you from all the family lawyers here because it is, to the academics in the room, it is traumatic to guide people through a divorce when all they want to say is, but that's wrong. But he took it, but he cheated, but she lied, but it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. And I have to tell them that, honestly, judge doesn't really care. I, I can't put up a two-hour argument about the adultery. It's really about what's left in the 401k. And no, I can't prove that they stole that money. So no, I can't really. So it's very, very frustrating. And it was just very nice to be here and, and to hear all of the academic ideas and to hear that you, you, you recognize that. It would be very nice for you guys to produce some kind of paper that we could hand to our clients to explain <laughs> to them that, that it's not just us because they just think that we're crappy lawyers and they just wander off to another <laughs> lawyer that says, oh, the affair? Well, you're getting all the stuff. Don't worry about it. So thank you for, for doing that. If you want to research that at any point, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it out. Thank you for your contributions. A rich discussion and uh, an ability to keep everybody awake at a late hour. John Witte. Well, thank you so much. We have not exhausted uh, any of the topics that we've taken up in our panels today, but I think we've exhausted each other with this wonderful, wonderful intellectual feast. I hope that uh, you have been satisfied. I hope that you will take away from these panel discussions a rich body of ideas that you'll continue to discuss uh, over dinner and drinks in the course of the evening. I hope that you will come back at 7.30 this evening for our final panel with Stephen Carter from Yale, the Chief Justice of Georgia, uh, Leah Ward Sears, and Dr. Enola Aird on Law, Religion, and the Future of the African American Family. Uh, if you can't come this evening, I hope you'll come back tomorrow morning, first thing, where we'll hear about the internal religious legal systems that are out there in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It's been a wonderful day. I want to say two logistical things. One, those of you that are returning to the Emory Conference Center or Emory Inn, I've been instructed that there are shuttle vans that will take you back uh, 
as soon as our session ends and they'll be rotating over the next half hour, they'll also be returning between 7 and 7.30 for those of you who wish to return. Likewise, the various shuttle vans that are going to the different parking decks that are made available to you as described on our center website are also immediately outside. And secondly, um, for those of you looking for restaurant selections, let me commend to you the little list of local uh, easy walking distance restaurants uh, on the inside cover of your program uh, that you have, and there are a number of them within 150 yards of walking, and I commend a number of those to you. None of them is great, I have to tell you, but all of them are more than adequate. It's been a wonderful day. Thank you so very much, and let's thank our panel one more time. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.